All right, I have with me here Hill Abel. Hill, how are you today? Good morning, John. I'm well. It's a brilliant day. <laughs> it is a brilliant day. Uh, so, Hill, uh, we're going to go out and uh, do a little bit of riding here in uh, Austin, Texas, and uh, uh, take a look at some infrastructure and have a chat with you. Thank Looking you for doing this. To it. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Okay, Thank you, John. cool. We'll come back to you in just a moment. Perfect day for it. Hey, this really is a perfect day. Yeah. Uh, I really appreciate you doing this. Now, uh, this is our neighborhood. We both live in yeah, this we neighborhood. Yeah, we do. We live in Zoker. <laughs> Center and, of the universe. Uh, that's right. And uh, you're, you're heading out of town, so you're, you're moving. I and, am. And heading After out. living in Austin for 44 years, I am moving to Salida, Colorado. Salida, Colorado. Yeah. So let's talk about the relevance <laughs> of this facility that we're coming into, since this is both uh, our facility in our neighborhood. Yeah. How important is this particular <laughs> two-way cycle track to this neighborhood, to this community on Blue Bonnet. Well, it's important for a lot of different reasons, John, and I think one of the primary reasons is it was one of the very first green lane projects that was installed to, after an initiative between People for Bikes and the city of Austin, and it was created um, really to demonstrate a protected bicycle facility for people in Austin. And it was put into the Zilker neighborhood because it's adjacent to Zilker Elementary School, which has a large cohort of kids that are walking to school every day and riding their bikes to school. And the city recognized that we needed a better facility on this busy street. <clears throat> and it's just been a phenomenal addition to the neighborhood. I think everybody in Zilker is really proud of it, that we were one of the very first protected bike facilities in the city. Uh, the city has recently come in and modified the existing infrastructure, made some really excellent tweaks to it to make it safer at corners, uh, all of the intersections, expanded the facility, and basically hardened it in a way that has just made it much more effective and much more durable. And I think it gives people more confidence to use it. Fantastic. And we just passed one of those uh, improved corners yeah. there, so you see. And uh, the next step is they'll be coming back and putting in concrete uh, to shore up those right. temporary sort of interim uh, facilities. And again, we can see that we've got uh, plenty of bikes there at the bike racks uh, here at Zilker Elementary. Uh, it kind of looks like to me, Hill, that uh, we probably need uh, more bike racks. More bike racks, absolutely. <laughs> Spring is springing and everybody wants to That's right. ride their bike to school on a beautiful day like today. Yeah. One of the things that I say frequently on the Active Towns channel is that uh, when it comes to bike paths and bikeways, uh, make them wider. Wider yeah. the better. Yeah. And when it comes to uh, bike parking, more. More, please. Thank you. <laughs> well, and I think we've seen that down at Barton Springs after they did the, uh, the grounds improvement at the pool. They installed an additional 120 bike racks. Right. And if you go down there today on a busy Saturday or Sunday, you will find that every one of those racks is filled and yeah. people are parking, we'll walking turn, their bikes we'll turn to right trees. Up here. Yeah, let's go ahead and turn right here. <laughs> and yeah. to anything that they can find. Yeah to secure their bicycle. So we obviously need more bike parking there as well. Yeah. And you know, since you bring that up, John, at one point the city of Austin had a budget for bike parking around town. Unfortunately, we no longer have that budget, as, as least as far as I'm aware of. Hmm. And it's a sore need for the city. Yeah. We need more bike parking all over downtown. And uh, it just, there's no capacity for it at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Something we need to work on. And one of the biggest challenges, too, um, you know, we'll talk about more, this more uh, a little bit later on, is the difference between capital dollars and operational dollars yeah. and staff. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth when we get over to City Hall yeah. about the bonds and, and raising capital dollars. Yeah. But then it comes down to, uh, you know, limited resources for staffing and designers and you things bet. of that nature and we can also discuss at that that time some of the creative things that the city has done yeah great all right well here we are we are now at another amazing two-way cycle track at a school talk a little bit about this uh, hill because this was uh, a little bit later than zilker 
This was quite a bit, probably what, five, six years after the Zilker mm -hmm. facility was installed. Yep. And, um, and here's our little uh, jiggle that we have to do, our wiggle. And this <laughs> one, oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't give you enough room. That's okay, I get a new, a new angle of you. <laughs> um, and I think that this one was so much more needed because this is a high speed road. Right. Um, it's a neighborhood road that was like a lot of our neighborhood roads built wide to accommodate enough cars, enough parking. Speaking of high speed road, we get to do our we, little we, we wiggle get to here. Expose ourselves a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, it did a great job of slowing traffic. There was actually a young man who crashed an automobile going an estimated 85 miles an hour coming home from high school one day. Yeah. And he, unfortunately, the young man died in that, that yeah. crash. Go ahead and take the uh, protected <laughs> bike right here. And I think that everybody realized that traffic has to be slowed on this street, but what's the best way to achieve that slowdown of traffic? Right. And any time that we're able to narrow the street, we immediately see a slowdown in traffic. And right. I think that's been such a, a significant change to this roadway that a lot of people that live in the neighborhood so appreciate it. Some people that are just passing through, driving through the neighborhood are a little annoyed by the fact that they have to slow down. Yeah. But I think that's the culture shift that we're starting to see in the United States, that people are recognizing the fact that it's safer for everybody using the road when the speeds are lower. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, it, it takes a little bit of time for us humans to adapt to change. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, <laughs> you know, sort of the stereotypical, uh, you know, open house meeting that we have yeah. has, uh, you know, maybe, well, honestly, it's a bunch of folks like you and me, gray yeah. hairs showing up, showing and, up. That's and, right. and, and complaining about the change because yeah. change is difficult to deal with. That's right. But you're, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that about the width because it doesn't take long before people kind of get used to it. They like slow down a little bit. They That's realize, right. oh, I can't take this at speed. That's right. And then it's okay. And they learn the, the turning process that yeah. they need to initiate. They have to give themselves a little bit more room and they have to slow down at intersections, which is one of the highest collision places on our roadways. Right. So let's talk a little bit about this intersection that we're at now, because now we are actually at a, a relatively recent installation. Uh, this particular uh, uh, concrete was poured a couple years ago, but in preparation for this uh, facility that we're going to see in just a minute. Yeah. And uh, so give a little bit of uh, background about this particular location and why you wanted to come here first and foremost. Well, because it's a very high traffic part of the neighborhood. Um, it's two major uh, connecting roadways that are intersecting right here. A lot of traffic and there's also a lot of pedestrian use. There's a lot of bicycle use on both of these roadways. And I think what the city recognized is that that a lot of people were having conflict in this intersection, specifically cars not yielding to pedestrians, people that were trying to cross at the intersection, and cars just being oblivious to the people that that are out here. Again, part of the culture change that we need to see happening in in the country in in Austin specifically. And um, I think that the initial pushback was, oh my God, I'm driving my suburban or my big pickup truck and I have to creep through the intersection where I used to be able to just roll right through it. Yeah. And yes, that's the point. You yeah. have to slow down and that enables people that are on foot to see you and you to see the people that are on foot. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I think it's been a net benefit and it's an adaptation process, like you say. We just have to get used to, to the change and people do inevitably. A friend of mine drives a van, yeah. uh, a big Sprinter van, and he was really annoyed about this and one other intersection in the neighborhood. And when he realized that if he would just slow down right. and ease around the corner he'd ha he would not hit the bollards he would not hit the curb so it's you can adjust to it yeah yeah and I love this particular location because when we you know kind of pan around and look at it just a little bit here um, 
this is what we're striving to get to, it's is this ideal. permanent infrastructure. Yep. Earlier we saw some of the temporary sort of interim infrastructure in the flex posts, which we can eventually get changed when their funding is available and the design time is available yep. to be able to do something like this. And so I think that's, that's a really important thing is that it works hand in hand. They needed to do this anyways because of some ADA work that needed yeah. to take place with the sidewalks. So they went ahead and, and got this done even a couple years before this installation went in this year. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the things that a lot of people don't understand and they don't appreciate about the work that the city is doing is the, the, the city staff is learning as they go with a lot of these, you know. The, this is new design standards that a lot of cities are implementing and they're figuring out things work, things don't work, they're willing to come back and modify it. And I think what's important is that citizens don't just be frustrated and angry about the changes, but communicate with the city. This is how this is impacting my ability to, to be mobile in the city. It's helping me, it's harming me. What, let, let's have conversation about it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the most important things that people remember. Reach out to the transportation department and say, could we talk about this new facility that was installed and what it's doing to my commute, my ability to get around town? Or tell them this is such a fabulous addition because now my kids can ride the five blocks to school where previously I would not feel safe uh, letting them ride yeah. Five blocks to school. Yeah. Now, earlier, I heard you talking an awful lot about pedestrians. Um, you know, when you really think of it, this type of infrastructure is not bike infrastructure. That's this right. is about livability for everybody. And That's I right. noticed your, your shirt. So talk, talk a little bit about Safe Streets Austin and why this, this message has evolved over the decades. Yeah. Well, I've been a bicycle advocate. I was in the bicycle industry for almost 40 years, and I've been a bicycle advocate that whole time. But what I think a lot of us in the bicycle advocacy realm have recognized is that we have so much in common with everybody that is on foot using scooters, mm -hmm. I think is a great example, that initially a lot of people in the bike community were really opposed to scooters because those people are using our bike lanes, those people are leaving scooters in the bike lanes on the sidewalks, but I think that we have to broaden our, our view of this type of mobility because it's a net benefit for all of us because it's more people that aren't using a personal motor vehicle to get around the city and it's much more sustainable from an ecological perspective as well as it's a fun and relatively safe way to get around town if the facilities are there that makes it safe for people to use and I think that is just more impetus for the city to invest in this type of infrastructure because we have 18,000 scooters in town right now and they're being heavily used every day of the week and let's make it possible for people to get around this way. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll see some of those scooters uh, as we make our way into yes, the downtown area. <laughs> and, and, and the B-cycle. And know? b -cycle, and, yeah. and I think that's one of the great things that with Capital Metro taking over control of the B-cycle system, they have the uh, resources to invest in that system. They've electrified the vast majority of the bicycles. So we see the B-cycle system being used so much more heavily today than it was just three years ago. So yeah. that's that's a very exciting transition. Uh, you used a term there, Cap Metro. Why don't you explain what Cap Metro is for the audience. Well, that's our, our, uh, our transit bus uh, lot rail uh, entity that's here. And um, I think that, that we, with Project Connect that we authorized two years ago, two and a half years ago, that would put in a significant new lot rail uh, addition. And the planning that's gonna go into that and the facilities that will support people getting to the lot rail will so benefit active transportation. It's gonna be sidewalks, it's gonna be new protected bicycle facilities that will help us connect all these ways to get around town without a personal automobile. Yeah, yeah, and we'll actually see some of that integration of the active mobility network to the transit stops and, and the key transit station when yeah. we get downtown. Yeah. So one of our biggest challenges, of course, is that uh, <laughs> sometimes we have uh, protected bike facilities that get blocked either. <laughs> Hopefully it's just temporarily. Um, this construction site has been going on for a little while, and so it's almost every day this happens. But um, fortunately, 
this time of day is a little <laughs> forgiving for us. We can just kind of move over. Um, but talk a little bit about that challenge of being able to still, you know, get the work done, get business done, and and landscaping and construction and all yeah. that other stuff, uh, but still be able to have, you know, safe infrastructure for us soft pedestrians and, and people on bikes? Well, I think it's a dynamic tension that we're always going to have in the city. Um, delivery vehicles that are quickly parking in a bike lane. But what that does is, especially in a heavy, heavily used facility, is it potentially can endanger dozens of people with yep. that FedEx driver being there for five minutes. Yeah. And I think that a lot of that impetus would be on how that building is designed and how it can accommodate deliveries. Yeah. And is the city... Let's go ahead and pop, stop here and let's talk okay. about this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as you were saying, you know, making those deliveries in the city. Uh, yeah, and making deliveries in the city. And is the city building code doing enough to require those developers to accommodate the facilities that are put on the street so that the, the trucks don't have to park on the street in the bike lane? Right. Yeah. And, you know, many other countries uh, actually do have workarounds. They're called protected temporary uh, facilities that, yeah. you know, shift the motor vehicles you over, bet. et cetera. Uh, may not be enough space to, to accommodate this, but the, the reality is, is that there seems to be different rules for uh, when a lane has to be stopped in the middle of a motor vehicle travel lane, they you find bet. a way to That's do right. flaggers yeah. and all sorts of stuff. That's so, exactly right. Yeah. Although I do want to come in the city, um, there's a big project at the corner of 24th and Rio Grande, yeah. and the city did completely close a, a vehicle lane to accommodate the protected bike facility that went through that area. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we stopped at this intersection for a reason. Uh, we actually want to take a look at the fact that, uh, as you mentioned earlier, you, you you take that first step, you put out that you know that first installation. You yeah. you get information back. You test how things are going. Yeah. Uh, and again, these dimensions. You know that first go round may not be just right. And so that's exactly what happened. Is the, the corners were maybe a little bit too sharp a for too some tight. of the, yeah. the, the 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 residents. And so yeah. uh, the di designers and engineers got back out here and looked at it and said, okay, yeah, we'll we'll loosen it up, but we're not going to take it out. No. Not by any means, yeah. I, you know, because I, people will adjust to the facility, as yep. we've said before, and that's what people have done with this facility. But the priority is everybody else that's using the facility, is it going to be safe for them? Yeah. Is it going to protect their health and well-being? And I think that should be the primary consideration. Yeah. Because the guy driving the big pickup truck or driving the automobile is not in danger of being hurt by the person on foot or on a bicycle. So let's think about the vulnerable road user first. Yeah, yeah. Should be the first priority. Yeah, well said. Yeah. All right, cool. And if we scan and we take a look at this, we see that, you know, this is going to be a future ADA, uh, you know, project because we do not have curb ramps here for the, the sidewalks. And so uh, on that side, uh, you see, we do have the curb ramp on this side, but we don't have it on that side. So uh, it's not going to be too much longer that we're going to see the fact that, you know, this could get poured into the same type of protected intersection that we saw down below. Yeah. Hardened facility. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Hill, so we just made our way down uh, this amazing facility up by the elementary school there uh, out on uh, Barton Hills Drive. And uh, we're, we're now kind of at this little intersection here. We also see that this is sort of the remnants of the other facility that we saw 
that serves Zilker Elementary. Yeah. And we see some trade-offs that had to take place on this hill. And we we see this kind of transition here. Um, talk a little bit historically from a con the context of, you know, historical precedent and, and you've been in this neighborhood uh, a long time. Talk about the challenges of being able to, you know, kind of take space away from cars to be able to carve something out <laughs> and make this happen. Because we're kind of like winging it on this. Well, the, the, this is the bottom of Blue Bonnet, the, yeah. uh, the roadway adjacent to Zilker Elementary yeah. School. And um, it was really a contentious project when it was first proposed yeah. about 10 years ago to put in this facility because it was a narrower roadway. Um, it literally had no room for a bike path at all yeah. coming down or going up specifically this hill. And it was a real challenge for a lot of people in the neighborhood. And, uh, and it had an inferior sidewalk as well. Yeah. Well, it's funny because this is the dividing line between Barton Hills neighborhood mm -hmm. and the Zilker neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And while those two neighborhoods coexist and collaborate on a lot of different projects, leadership within the two neighborhood associations at the time got into conflict because they wanted this uh, large uh, shared use path mm -hmm. to be on their side of the neighborhood as yeah. opposed on the Barton Hills side of the neighborhood. But if you go up this hill, you'll see that there's significant geographical challenges. Uh, yeah. There's a big bluff, there's a big cliff that yeah. would have to be dealt with, yeah. and it would be much, much more expensive. But the Zilker neighborhood people just fought tooth yeah. and nail to have that path on their side of the neighborhood yeah. because we're the ones that have advocated for it, for yeah. it all these years yeah, and, yeah. you know, all these different justifications. Yeah. But, but the city, of course, did the right thing and put it on the west side of the roadway yeah. and put in this beautiful eight foot wide shared use path. Yeah. And there's a climbing lane when you're coming down the other side, you're going so fast, you really don't need a bike facility because yeah. you're hitting 25, 30 miles an hour, which is the speed limit. And that's and that's okay for us, you know, for, for more advanced riders, we'll do that. We'll yeah. take the lane and we'll go 20 miles an hour plus down there. You bet. But we'll see that the kids and the more cautious riders, they will actually use the wider uh, shared use path yeah. um, for their descent as we see other people in the climbing lane going up. So I just wanted to kind of cover yeah. the fact that we're kind of we're we're kind of you know piecing it together. We're making it work. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I think it works beautifully beca yeah. because it does accommodate all needs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not ideal because it's not on both sides right. of the street. Yeah. But it would just not be financially viable to yeah. do both sides of the yeah. street. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to take this little trail and we're going to show how kids and parents everybody. and adults and everybody, yeah. all ages and abilities, can actually get all the way from this neighborhood to downtown yeah. and be on high comfort network. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Yeah, these bike racks will be completely packed full and they'll be locked into trees over here, over here, locked into these signposts. It's just absolutely crazy how many bikes will be down here on a yeah. on a beautiful busy weekend. On a bit beautiful busy weekend. Which uh, we should be getting some of those really yes, soon. Yes, they're yeah. on top of us. Yeah. Summertime is here. So talk a little bit about this. We're now on a natural surface trail and uh, honestly, when I go to the grocery store, I spend a fair amount of time on natural surface trail. Yeah. And, and it's just fine. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, it is such a viable way to build paths around town. And it's so much less expensive than pouring concrete. And, um, but it's not widely used anymore. Uh, I'm excited that the new Violet Crown Trail, which is a long distance trail that's mm -hmm. gonna go from basically the other, the trailhead here at Barton Springs Pool, mm -hmm. and will go almost 32 miles all the way down to Kyle. And the bulk of that trail will be crushed granite. It has several concrete bridges for creek crossings, but it's gonna be a phenomenal trail for people on bicycles, on foot, and uh, just uh, such an asset for Central Texas. Yeah.
Obviously, some of the challenges when you use the natural surface trails, you may have to use some substrate underneath yeah. to help keep the, um, the crushed granite and the, the natural surface substrate from washing away. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you know, it, 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 it is a maintenance challenge. You do have to get the crews back out to, to you know, fill in those ruts That's uh, right. when they occur. But uh, it, like you said, you can do many, many more miles. Plus, from a sustainability perspective, uh, it's natural surface. You can have you know the water being able to easily percolate through it. That's right. And so it's a little better for the environment overall. <laughs> well, and it's a lot better considering the the carbon load required for concrete. Yeah, it's a good point. Which is just extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. And while they're developing new types of concrete that will be much less carbon intensive, yeah. it's still a long ways off. Yeah. And I also like to say that, you know, as a general rule of thumb, when you're on a natural surface trail in the city of Austin, you're typically on a parks and rec facility. Yeah. And uh, when you're on a paved path, separated path, it's usually the urban trails program. And then uh, when you're on an on-street network facility, then you're on the, the Department of Transportation <laughs> facility. Yeah. But the good news is now, Public Works and Transportation are one entity. They're all one big department. <laughs> it's all one big family. One big happy family. So we hope. Yeah. Uh, par <laughs> Parks and Rec is still out there on its own, but yeah. uh, and in, in fact, what, an interesting feature to this trail is it is actually maintained through a mem memorandum of understanding. That's right. With a nonprofit. With the Trail Foundation. Yeah. Yes. Talk a little bit about that. Which That's is, pretty extraordinary. It's pretty extraordinary. Um, it has been a, a challenge for decades to adequately fund the Parks Department. So the Trail Foundation was created about 15 years ago as a nonprofit ag advocacy organization to support the maintenance and future development of the Lady Bird Lake Trail, the Roberta Crenshaw Bridge. <laughs> and it has been a fabulous collaboration because what it has allowed the city to do is to hand off daily maintenance for or, or supervision of the trail <clears throat> so that they can have their nonprofit staff out here doing some minor work, but supporting the city and helping them understand what needs to be done to keep the trail in good condition. Yeah, and, and in addition to the fact that they sort of are the ringleaders along with the Austin Parks Foundation to some large capital projects and uh, that's right and and those types of things where you really need to rally the community yeah well a great example of that is the boardwalk that was partially funded by a, a bond that was authorized in 2012 but the trail foundation went out and raised another i believe it was five to six million dollars that allowed that 17 million dollar facility to be built and it is just such a gorgeous addition to the hike and bike trail around Lady Bird Lake. Yeah. All right. I'll let you take the right okay. side since it's the lower side. Yeah. <laughs> you wanna go over the bridge? Yeah, let's go over yeah. the bridge. and ride this little uh, little section. Okay, sure. Little protected. Yeah. <laughs> the message I want from this is to talk a little bit about, you know, working with developers to get the infrastructure put in. Yeah. 
<laughs> They're upgrading them. They had the old style. Yeah. That needs to be trimmed. That's a thorn tree. That's a thorn tree. We need to <laughs> trim that bugger. <laughs> so th this is another great facility, and it was a collaboration with the developer of this piece of property, the Taco Cabana Pud, as it is called. And um, the developer was willing to fund the establishment of a protected bicycle facility, as well as a shared use path on the other side of the building. Yeah, it's pretty extraordinary. And that's exactly the type of interaction that you'd like to see cities yeah. uh, be you know, proactively working with the developers to really you know, take that opportunity to, to get the infrastructure in place because it's actually in advance of what could eventually be a protected intersection right up that's above. That's right. So. Hopefully that's going to happen. It'll, it'll happen. It's been in the works for a little while. It's been, it'll happen. Yeah. We just have to outlast certain people. <laughs> well, and, and, and I think that's the, the, the positive change in the mindset of a lot of people in the development community is they see the value that it adds to their development. Yeah. And it supports the people that are visiting their place. Yeah. It supports the community at large. And I think it's a, a I don't, don't want to say it's greenwashing in any way, yeah. but, but it's definitely demonstrating their commitment to the active transportation community, yeah. which is growing in Austin every day. Yeah. And that concludes part one of my ride with Hill Abel. Uh, tune in next time as we head downtown. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this ride along video. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the Active Towns channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.